Hello, all you happy people, and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Let's talk about what Sony has been doing with Spider-Man. They're in a unique position, as since Disney swallowed up 20th Century Fox, they're pretty much the only major studio making Marvel movies outside of Marvel itself. And this might come as a surprise, but I actually think it's a good thing to have more than one studio making Marvel films. Disney, huge as they are, can't do everything on their own. We need to have more than one player in the market, and their relationship with Sony is actually pretty interesting. They get to offload production of the Spider-Man movies while still having the friendly neighborhood web-slinger as part of the MCU, and Sony still gets to make their own movies in the Spider-Man universe that may or may not be connected to one of the three big screen portrayals of the character. It seems like they're supposed to be in the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man universe, but the powers that be at Sony keep going back and forth on that one. It's a little murky. In any case, Sony's handling of the Spider-Man universe has had its ups and downs. We got five solid Spider-Man movies, two animated, three live action, along with Tom Holland appearing as Peter Parker in three MCU movies. But anytime they've tried to do a Spider-Man movie that did not directly involve Spider-Man, the results haven't been as good. I did enjoy the Venom movies and found the titular symbiote very entertaining, but those movies are not without their flaws. They have some pacing issues and would have been much better served with an R rating. However, they still weren't as bad as Sony's next effort at putting a Spider-Man character on the big screen. Morbius. Directed by Daniel Espinosa and starring ugh, Jared Leto as the titular character, the movie tells the story of Dr. Michael Morbius, a brilliant scientist with a debilitating condition requiring regular blood transfusions who resorts to extreme measures to try to cure himself. As a side effect, he becomes a vampire. The movie was originally supposed to come out in July of 2020, and I trust I don't have to explain why that didn't happen. Eventually, it was released on, of all days, April Fool's Day 2022. Sometimes, the jokes write themselves. The movie was a critical failure and received two Razzies, Worst Actor for Jared Leto and Worst Supporting Actress for Adria Arjona. It made $167 million at the box office, about double its production budget, but still well below what Sony was hoping for. It did become extremely popular among the movie going public, but for all the wrong reasons. A torrential downpour of internet memes ensued, with people either trashing the movie or ironically praising it, or just generally being silly. Making fake movie posters and Rotten Tomato screenshots, claiming it made $300 trillion, turning the word morb into a verb, and falsely claiming Leto said, it's morbin time during the movie. There was a fake quote from Martin Scorsese praising the movie that was briefly shared by Tyrese Gibson, who stars in the film. He deleted it later, leading to speculation that he initially thought it was real. Even Leto himself got in on the action, posting a video of him getting caught with a fake script for Morbius 2. Studio executives at Sony caught wind of the Morbius memes and mistook the attention the movie was getting for genuine interest because they are apparently too stupid to understand the difference between laughing with you and laughing at you. And they decided the best way to capitalize on the movie's internet fame was to re-release it to about a thousand theaters. It made a paltry $300,000 and was pulled after one week, giving it the rare distinction of underperforming at the box office twice. Let's take a look at why the movie failed. It becomes abundantly clear just what kind of mess we're in for immediately during the cold open, where Dr. Michael Morbius is flown to the Cerro de la Muerte, or Hill of Death, in Costa Rica. This is a real place, and it is actually called that because of the difficult terrain, though it's considerably less difficult since they built a highway. Morbius is here to capture some vampire bats, as they are apparently the key to his secret medical experiments that he hopes will produce a cure for his condition. After rattling off some facts about vampire bats that I won't bother to repeat because I know you don't care, he places a trap in front of a cave, slices his own hand, and uses the scent of his blood to attract the bats. This causes a massive swarm to fly out of the cave, and it's virtually impossible to tell if any of them actually end up in the trap. This is one of the most bizarre opening scenes I have ever seen. Why was this the best way to capture vampire bats? And why did you have to use your own blood to do it? Couldn't you have used an animal? In fact, why are you there at all? Considering you can barely walk, visiting a place that was named for its difficult terrain seems unwise. Also, if the bats are attracted to his blood, why are none of them attacking him directly? None of this makes any sense, and the movie just started. 
Anyway, despite his questionable methods, Morbius is highly regarded as a genius thanks to his discovery of artificial blood, which has saved countless lives. He's awarded a Nobel Prize for this, but during the award ceremony, he tells the entire country of Sweden and the greater scientific community to lick his taint because he only discovered the artificial blood by accident while researching a cure for his condition, and therefore, he doesn't deserve the award. We don't actually see him tell everyone at the Nobel ceremony to kick rocks, by the way. We just hear him talk about it after the fact. Because as we all know, the most important rule of cinema is tell, don't show. His actions prompt a scolding by Dr. Martine Bancroft, played by Arjona, who is Michael's assistant and romantic interest. Though I did not realize she was the latter until very late in the movie where we see them kiss for the first, and I think only, time. The kiss seriously caught me off guard. I had no idea they were supposed to be an item, as they have no chemistry at all. As I mentioned earlier, Arjona won a Razzie for this movie, and while I wouldn't say she was that bad, I did find one aspect of her performance baffling. She claimed in an interview that she took inspiration for her character from Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. What? I am shocked by this revelation. Not because I really have anything against AOC, I just did not pick up on that at all while watching this movie. Claudia Dumit's character in The Boys was clearly based on AOC. That was obvious. Dr. Bancroft... Unless we lost something in the reshoots, I'm calling bullshit on that one. Also, Arjona apparently has no idea how to pronounce Nobel, and no one corrected her. And I don't think it's her accent. It sounds like she's actually saying noble. American scientist rejects Nobel Prize. You know that people actually like writing checks to Nobel laureates? How did nobody catch that? How did the director not catch that? Daniel, you're from Sweden. The Nobel Prize is awarded in Sweden. You of all people! While any normal human being would probably be very happy to be known as the person who created a modern medical miracle that saved countless lives, Morbius is squarely focused on his own life, attempting to cure his condition by fusing human and vampire bat DNA. I could try to explain how this is supposed to work, but it won't make it any less silly. When he's not running experiments or taking care of patients at his hospital, and I'm not going to ask how he got all of this equipment in said hospital without anyone asking questions, he hangs out with his old friend Milo, played by Matt Smith, who is also Morbius' financial backer with a vested interest in his research as Milo suffers from the same condition. His real name is actually Lucian, but Morbius started calling him Milo when they were kids at a medical facility in Greece for... very strange reasons. The person who was here before was Milo. No, he was also the new Milo. Before him was the other new Milo. I don't even remember the first Milo. You're weird. Actually, this entire flashback to Morbius' childhood is weird. I understand why he's in Greece, the character from the comics is supposed to be Greek. But Michael, Lucien, and everyone in and around this hospital speaks English with either an American or British accent. How does that work? Also, the adults in this hospital appear to be largely absent as no one comes to help Lucien when he's being bullied, nor when his transfusion machine fails and Michael has to fix it his damn self by replacing a fuse with the spring from his pen. This, by the way, is what leads Michael's doctor, played by Jared Harris, to suspect Michael is a genius. Really? I mean, yes, it was quick thinking on his part, and he did save Milo's life, no thanks to your neglectful ass, but simply knowing how electricity works does not necessarily make one a genius. Speaking of not being a genius, let's talk about Jared Leto for a second. I'm sure many of you have heard about his on-set antics and method acting approach in other movies. It makes me wonder why anyone would want to work with him. Well, according to Leto himself, he did not go method for this movie. The director, however, would refute this claim. The character Morbius, prior to his vampiric transformation, required crutches to move around. According to Espinosa, Leto insisted on constant use of the crutches to stay in character. He ultimately compromised by agreeing to use a wheelchair, but this still slowed his movement on set. His bathroom breaks in particular were exceedingly long. This reminds me of an infamous story about the filming of the movie Marathon Man. Dustin Hoffman's character was supposed to have been awake for three days, so Hoffman himself did the same thing to improve his performance. His co-star, Laurence Olivier, then told him, My dear boy, why don't you try acting? And I really wish someone would tell Leto the same thing, because it's gotta be easier than whatever the hell he's trying to do, and it would make him less insufferable. 
So back to the present day, Michael has perfected his formula and is ready to test it on himself. But since what he's doing is not exactly legal, he and Dr. Bancroft have to charter a boat and conduct the test in international waters. They also have a bunch of armed mercenaries on board for reasons that are never made clear as far as the story is concerned. But really, they're just there to give Morbius someone to kill when he goes full Dracula. The vampire bat DNA cures his disease, but transforms him into some sort of vampiric monster whose body is now partly vaporous for some reason? This is something I found very puzzling. Now, I can suspend my disbelief to a certain point. If a radioactive spider can bite Peter Parker and give him spider powers, I can believe Morbius injecting himself with vampire bat DNA would give him vampire bat powers. But why is he smoky? It makes it look like there's something supernatural going on here, and that is not the case. So Morbius goes apeshit in a sequence that would probably be quite scary if it wasn't so poorly shot. I can barely tell what's going on half the time. That's true for most of the action sequences in this movie for that matter. The bullet time sequences are not edited very well, and the smoky effects often obscure the action. It does not look good at all. Anyway, Morbius eventually gets control of himself and, after realizing what he's done, makes a distress call and swims back to shore. He returns to his lab, which he is apparently able to walk right into with no trouble, despite being a missing person and suddenly able to walk without crutches. Apparently that hospital has the same level of security as the one he was in as a child. And this is where Morbius exposits the full extent of his powers, which leads to this infamous line. I've even developed a form of echolocation. Bat radar for the uninitiated. Yeah, we know what echolocation is, you twits. And literally no one calls it bat radar. But while he has some cool new tricks and his disease has been cured, it's not without its side effects. He must regularly feed on blood or return to the animalistic form that went crazy and killed all those mercenaries. At first it looks like his disease being cured is also dependent on blood, but they drop that pretense pretty quickly with no explanation. Artificial blood appears to work, but only for a few hours and the window shrinks with each dose. And here's what I don't get. He has actual human blood right there in that refrigerator. Why doesn't he try that? I know he said he doesn't want to feed on people, but drinking those samples is not going to hurt anyone, and it might at least buy him some time. Also, is there some reason why animal blood is out of the question? That's what real vampire bats feed on, but somehow this idea never occurs to him. Nobel Prize winning scientist Dr. Michael Morbius, ladies and gentlemen. Milo finds Michael in the lab and is very excited that he's found a cure for their condition, and he demands Michael hand it over. But Michael understandably refuses as he doesn't want to turn his friend into a goddamn vampire. What, so, so, so you get to live and I get to die, is that it? Yeah, he gets to live as a blood-sucking monster. You just saw him shapeshift into that monster. That doesn't give you any pause at all? While that nonsense is going on, a couple of feds, Simon Stroud and Al Rodriguez, played respectively by Tyrese Gibson and Al Madrigal, examine the now corpse-ridden ship where Morbius got his first taste of human blood. On the ship, Stroud finds an origami bat, and this one piece of evidence somehow leads him directly to Morbius as the culprit. So he's the only person in New York City who does origami? They throw Michael in jail, which freaks him out because he's going to start flipping out and killing people if he doesn't get enough blood. I'm starting to get hungry. You don't want to see me when I'm hungry. Oh, shut up. But his friend Milo visits him with a bag of red blood because even the jails in this universe have no security. Seeing the blood and realizing Milo looks much healthier, Morbius correctly deduces he took the cure. And unlike Michael, Milo has no qualms about feasting on people, as demonstrated in a scene that might be creepy if it wasn't so ridiculous. We see a nurse walking down a hallway in Michael's hospital in the middle of the night, and apparently the motion sensors on these lights are so sensitive that they only turn on when you're directly under them and immediately turn off once you're not. This must be annoying as hell to walk down a hallway with the lights constantly turning on and off. And probably a safety hazard as well. A safety hazard in a hospital. Go figure. Eventually, we get a poorly shot fight between the two former friends that makes it very clear this movie was not actually filmed in New York. I desperately need to hear the thought process of the person who thought the London tube could somehow pass for the New York subway. Anyway, realizing they're evenly matched and continuing to fight Milo would be pointless, Morbius flees and takes over an underground counterfeit money lab, turning it into a medical lab. Because in this universe, those two things use the exact same equipment.
I'm no medical researcher, but I'm pretty sure that's not how that works. This leads to another infamous line after Michael breaks pretty much every bone in this thug's hand. Who the hell are you, man? I am Venom. <laughs> well, thanks for making it clear that this takes place in the same universe as Venom. I guess. Six to eight weeks of ibuprofen. Should heal up just fine. You just broke several bones in his hand. It's gonna take a lot more than ibu fucking profen to fix that. Morbius uses the lab to create a vampirism antibody, which he plans to inject in Milo and himself. The vaccine will likely kill both of them, but it's a sacrifice he's willing to make. Meanwhile, Milo attacks Martine to draw out Michael, which seems kind of pointless since he intended to fight him anyway, and she dies. Though not before getting a taste of Michael's blood, and apparently that one drop was enough to resurrect her at the end of the movie. Oh sure, why not? And Morbius summons a massive swarm of bats, because he can do that now, and injects Milo with the antibody, killing him. But despite his previous claim that he would inject himself as well, Morbius decides, fuck it, I'll just live as a vampire. Well, good for him. Ooh boy, this movie is so dumb. But to be fair, there are times when it's enjoyably dumb. And those times are whenever Matt Smith is on camera. He seems to be the only cast member who realized what sort of train wreck he was in, and he just embraced it. He is a joy to watch. When he's not covered in that stupid smoke effect, of course. I mean, how can you not love the dancing scene? Honestly, if the movie was just 90 minutes of Matt Smith dancing, I think it would have been much more well-received. But whenever Matt Smith is not on camera, it's a hot mess. And I'm not sure that's entirely the fault of the director or the cast, even if Espinosa himself might disagree based on a recent interview with Deadline. To make a movie through committee, I think, is very hard, and I felt in the end that maybe a different director would have been a better fit. I don't know if anyone would have been a good fit for this mess, but Morbius does feel like a movie made by committee. Reportedly it had four writers, even though only two are credited, and there is plenty of evidence that it went through extensive rewrites and reshoots, and likely does not resemble Espinosa's original vision. J.K. Simmons filmed a cameo as J. Jonah Jameson, but was cut from the theatrical release after the producers realized Morbius could not take place in the Tom Holland Spider-Man universe, which seems a bit odd considering what happens in the mid credit scene. We'll get to that in a bit. But why couldn't Simmons just play an alternate version of the same character? It wouldn't be the first time. If Marvel is officially done with the Council of Kangs, I say they give us the Council of Jamesons. You look me in the eye and tell me you would not pay to see that. The trailer also showed Morbius walking by some Spider-Man graffiti that was reportedly digitally inserted into the movie without the director's knowledge, but removed before the theatrical release. Also, remember Simon Stroud, Tyrese's character? I briefly mentioned him earlier and didn't say a whole lot about his role in the movie. And that's because there's really not much to say. He clearly was supposed to have a much bigger role. The trailer includes some scenes with him that are not in the movie, and you can see he has a cybernetically enhanced arm. Evidence of his cyber arm has almost entirely been removed from the theatrical cut. There's one shot near the end where you can kind of see it if you squint, but that's it. And I'm guessing this line of dialogue was part of the reshoots where they wrote his cyber arm out of the movie. First I want to say thank you, because your artificial blood actually saved my arm in Afghanistan, so... I would really like to see a shooting script for this movie. I'm so curious what these FBI agents were supposed to do. In the theatrical cuts, they don't really do anything. They're always there, but that's it. They don't accomplish anything, they don't really advance the plot. They're just... there. And speaking of people who are just there, there's a little girl Morbius is treating at his hospital, and she suffers some sort of attack and has to be placed in a medically induced coma. We never see her come out of that coma. Nor do we see her die, so I have no idea what happens to this little girl. The movie just kind of forgets about her. I seriously doubt that was the original plan. And now let's talk about that mid credit scene, because that also underwent some changes. After our story ends, Michael Keaton as Adrian Toomes, otherwise known as Vulture from Spider-Man Homecoming, suddenly appears in a prison cell. This likely has something to do with the events in Spider-Man No Way Home. He's quickly released, as in this universe he hasn't actually committed a crime. 
Well, that's only fair. In the trailer, we see him talking to Morbius as he's leaving prison, but in the theatrical cut, he and Morbius meet outside of town when he flies up in his vulture gear. I'm not sure how he got that unless it somehow was transported to this universe with him. It was supposed to be based on Chitauri technology, which I don't think is supposed to exist in this universe, but... Anyway, he suggests he and Morbius should team up to do... something. I'm not sure how I got here. Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. Oh, so you are allowed to mention Spider-Man in this movie? But you couldn't have Jameson. Make it make sense! This Vulture cameo at the end of the movie confused a lot of people, including Keaton himself, who stated he had no idea what the point was. Possibly it's meant to set up a Sinister Six movie somewhere down the line? I don't know, your guess is as good as mine. Overall, Morbius is crap, but as the internet memes would suggest, it can be enjoyable crap if you're in the right frame of mind. Just make sure you know what you're getting into. You're not getting No Way Home, you're not even getting Let There Be Carnage, but you will at least get a few laughs. And that, ladies and gentlemen, and all points in between, is the end of Morbin Time. But wait. It's the future. I see... another Spider-Man movie without Spider-Man. And it's somehow worse than Morbius? No, that can't be a glimpse into my actual future. Can it? I made a terrible mistake, Milo.